Hey everyone, with Dragon's Dogma 2 right around the corner, this is one of the many games I'm really excited to play. And if you're watching this video, I'd imagine you're here for the same reason. Here are some tips and overall information I feel will help aid you upon your journey as you venture into the mystical lands of Drake's Chimeras and more, especially if this is your first time ever diving into the series. However, if you played the first game before, some of this may sound familiar to you. When you first start up the game after creating your character, you will have the options to pick from four starting classes or vocation as they're called in this game, from fighter, archer, thief, and mage. There will be additional vocations that you unlock as the journey progress, as seen here. No worries about which class you pick since your choice is not permanent and if you find yourself not digging the playstyle for any reason, you'll be able to change it at a vocation guild located in the nearby towns. Your health bar is the green bar you see at the bottom and depending on the damage you may take whether it's from enemies or the environment, there's healable health you can recover. Meanwhile, there may be a black portion on your health bar that you won't be able to recover until you rest at an inn or a campsite. As you defeat enemies and loot chests found throughout the game, you'll acquire this game's currency called Discipline. You can use these to unlock new vocations. As you get higher ranks, you unlock new skills and special abilities called Augments. In Dragon's Dogma 2, you can have up to 6 Augment slots. Augments you gain from one can be moved over to other vocations. You have two kinds of levels, your character's level and your vocation or class's rank. Your vocation's rank can go from 1 to 9. To level up your vocation's rank, you'll need all the discipline points you can get from battle. Some abilities you unlock earlier on are really helpful, like the Archer's Endurance ability that lets you have more stamina. Much like the first game, as you explore, there are plenty of items you're going to pick up and gather. For example, the Fighter Vocations give you more weight, allowing you the ability to carry more items on you. Weight can also dictate how far you can jump and how fast you can move. Each of the 10 vocations found in this game will have unique core skills that affect your character. For Mages and sorcerers, for example, they have the ability to levitate, but not only that, they can also cast spells while they're doing so. This can definitely give you an upper hand in battle depending on what you're going up against. While navigating the world, it can certainly help you reach those hard to reach places you otherwise wouldn't be able to get to if you were playing another class with the regular jump. Meanwhile, the thief has the ability to jump off walls. The world of Dragon's Dogma 2 is much bigger, in fact it's four times bigger than the first game. This game will be far from being a big empty open world, with dynamic events, NPCs to talk to and places to see, and monsters to battle. If you want to get around the map faster, you can use an ox cart, which helps you travel long distances, but it does come with risks. Sometimes bandits might block your way or a griffin might attack your cart as you're trying to make your way to your destination. There's also a way to fast travel using port crystals, but you can only go to places you've already found or discovered, and you'll need to use fairy crystals crystals each time you travel, which can get pretty expensive especially when you're first starting out. One of the great things about Dragon's Dogma 2 is the freedom of exploration, which can feel incredibly rewarding, much like how it feels when you're playing Elden Ring. But you may end up in an area you shouldn't be at and trigger an event that's meant for later on. There are also plenty of different ways for you to approach things that may be blocking your path like a locked door. You can find a way around it to unlock it. NPCs you come across go about their daily lives adding a layer of immersion that enriches your adventure. There are over thousands of characters in this game with each of their own stories and backgrounds. There are even stealth missions in this game with entirely different outcomes depending on if you get caught or sneak all the way through to forging fake items to try and pass off as the real thing in order to complete a quest. When you're on an adventure, be sure to make the most out of your items. You have the ability to craft powerful and potent potions to crafting gear. Resting at a campsite is important to getting your team's health back, but be careful where you rest because you might end up fighting unexpected monsters like a griffin if you're not careful. Resting also changes the time of day to night, and certain monsters may only appear when it's dark. Just like in the first game, you have the ability to pick up heavy stones, explosive barrels, and even people to throw. Be careful if you do throw people off because obviously you're going to end up killing them, and this can prevent you from completing a quest line till you're able to use a wake stone at their tomb. While you do have the ability to use the environments against your enemies, certain enemies will also be able to use the environment to their own advantage advantages too. Wing enemies like harpies and griffins can grab your party members or even you, which can result in death if you're too high up in the air. 
Pawns, as you know, will be making a return here. Your main pawns that accompany you will level up alongside with you along your journey. And you'll be able to hire two additional pawns, whether it's recruited at the Riftstone or during your journey along the way. You can form a party of up to four, including the Arisen. They gain experience and knowledge, improving their effectiveness in combat and support. Depending on your vocation and your party's composition of pawns may significantly impact the combat strategies and outcome. I made my Arisen a thief and my main pawn a warrior. The warrior will have the ability to gain access to a skill where it can launch my Arisen and other pawns onto a monster or areas I otherwise wouldn't be able to reach. Since I'm going to be playing as a thief when launched, I'll be able to grapple onto a monster to dish out a ton of damage, much like the first game or similar in a way to Monster Hunter. Enemies can be climbed or mounted on top, giving you a new way to attack an enemy and weak points you otherwise wouldn't have access to. Your main pawn may also assist other players in their games, gaining new insight and items that benefit you in your current journey when they return. There are there are also riftstones spread throughout the world besides the one you usually find in town. These will be ones where you can find specific pawns, say if you're looking for a mage to join your party or to replace another pawn. You'll be able to do so when you come across it. Pawn inclinations is how your pawns or companions in this game essentially act during combat, but also the strategy they use and overall demeanor outside of combat. Say if you don't like the way your archer acts, you can change your pawn's inclination to sit back and pick shots from a distance versus being in melee range from enemies. Pawn specialization are a unique feature of pawns. For example, Woodland Wordsmith is the ability to translate Elvish. This is one of many specializations. If a pawn who has learned Elvish is nearby, they will automatically interpret it for you. This may grant you access to quests you wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. Another we don't have a ton of information on is Dragon's Plague. It's a contagious disease-like condition that affects pawns as they travel between worlds. Rather than being weakened, it is said that pawns with this disease become even stronger with a buff and bold in their speech and behavior. According to folklore, when the symptoms of the Dragon's Plague reaches a terminal stage, it will result in devastating calamity, but the veracity of those claims is unclear. I'm very curious to see what this will look like when we get our hands on the game. So which class will you and your pawn be playing as? Let me know below in the comments. As I've said myself, I'm going to be playing as a thief while my pawn will be a warrior. I hope you found this video helpful in some way, and if you did, subscribe to the channel for more Dragon's Dogma content, and thanks for watching.